Come on in. When you come in, click share for me. Good evening. Good evening. I hope everybody had a really good day. And you are watching Live Talk with Benita Bradley. I am your host, Benita. So come on in. We're going to talk for a little bit. Come on in. Come on in. Hit share for me when you come in. So I'm not going to be on long. I'm trying not to. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you tonight about um, how does faith work? How does faith work? So some of you that follow me um, regularly and you follow, you've been following my journey and my story regularly. You guys know I'm a brain tumor uh, survivor and patient and champion. Um, I call it the living grave. I hate that thing, that, the uh, MRI thing. I hate going through that thing. Absolutely hate it. Um, because then they have to hook me up to the IV and all that kind of stuff. It's just, ah. But today was one of those days. So I wanted to, uh, so after they were done with all the tests and everything, I just sat in my car. I couldn't even leave the hospital. I just sat in the parking lot in my car, just like, talking to God and just like telling God, you know, on one side I was saying thank you. And then, you know, another side of me was like, I'm tired, you know, but my thank yous outweighed me being tired. However, there are times when your I'm tired seem to outweigh your thank yous. So tonight I want to talk to you about how does faith work? What does it take to uh, get your faith going? What does it take to rebuild your faith after, you know, um, it's been gone a while? Hold on, let me see. I don't know how much. Let's see. Uh, let's see if that's any better. This looks like you're only seeing the top of my head. Hold on. Let me get situated. Okay, there we go. That's better. All right. If you can see me better, just say that's better. Because it looks like only the top of my uh, head was showing. I think I fixed the problem. Um, I think I fixed it. Okay, it's fixed. All right, so again, uh, thank you for tuning in to Live Talk with Benita Bradley. I'm your host, Benita, and I am wishing you a very, very good evening. Hope you had a wonderful day. Um, if not, you know, you, when you wake up in the morning, thank God for new mercies. You can try to do it all over again and have a better day tomorrow. All right, um, hope you guys are practicing all of the uh, things that have been implemented to keep us safe during this time. And hopefully uh, this will be over soon and we can get back to some degree of normalcy in our daily lives. OK. Um, and we thank God that uh, we have not uh, have been not have been touched by it as of yet. Now, some of our loved ones and close friends and relatives and uh, church colleagues have been touched tremendously by it, and we are praying for them, particularly uh, Church of God in Christ. They seem to have been hit the hardest, uh, and uh, I don't know why, um, but I do want to have that discussion. Not tonight, um, but I do want to have that discussion. Perhaps one day this week, we want to have that discussion. And perhaps talk to some of the people that are in Church of God in Christ and try to get a handle on what's really going on behind the scenes. And, you know, and so um, but tonight I want to talk to you about how faith works. Uh, what does it take to activate your faith? Because I was sharing with you guys earlier 
um, being a brain tumor patient, it, it, it requires it requires faith. Those of you that have gone through uh, cancer treatments, those of you that have gone through um, being a caretaker for your loved ones, those of you that have gone through any you know form of serious illness, it takes faith. There was a certain level of faith that has to be activated uh, for different things. Uh, you go and apply for a loan or something, that's one level of faith. You know, you go and try to get a job, a job you really want, that's one level of faith. Uh, you're praying for someone to be healed, that's one level of faith. But when you have to walk through the valley in the shadow of death, that requires a whole nother level of faith like you probably uh, have not seen before. It requires not only a level of faith, but that particular level of faith uh, comes in conjunction with your relationship to God. So uh, what we're going to talk about tonight, it's all going to lead back to the relationship aspect of how do we get faith to work for us? You cannot have faith working in your behalf without a relationship. It's kind of like going to a stranger and saying, hey, can you give me this or can you give me that? But you have no relationship with that particular person, but you expect for them to just give to you freely. You know, and particularly in today's society, most people are not that friendly, you know, to just give to you just because you say you have a need or you ask them for something. And such as it is with God, we, we can't just, you know, just live vicariously. And then just because we have a need, you know, we start to, God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. But we don't spend any time with him. We don't love on him. We don't worship him. We don't do any of that. But and when we have a need, he's the first one we, we want to run to. Um, and so faith has to be activated. Each level that you go through in your life or each thing that you might go through in, in your life, it's going to require a different level of faith. And so. Uh, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how does faith work, particularly when you are in the midst of a crisis. We're in a global crisis. But what about when you're in your personal crisis and you really need uh, God's hand in that particular situation? You really, really need to know that God is with you. You really need to know that he will never leave you. You really need to know these things. And so what has to happen, you have to have a level of faith that goes beyond what you can see. You know what I'm saying? You have to have a level of faith that goes even beyond what you know, what you hear, what you experience. Your level of faith has to be based upon your relationship with God. And sometimes you can pull back and, and lean back on previous uh ways that the Lord has brought you out when it seemed like there was absolutely no way out and then he brought you out or when it seems like there was absolutely no way to be made then all of a sudden he made a way or go through first that kind of relationship with God will lead you to different levels of your experience God starts to say well I trust you to go through this and I trust you to go through this and not false accuse me I trust you to go through this and declare that I'm still sovereign. I trust you to go through this and still say that I am the Lord. You know, that's another level of faith because that's another level of your relationship with the Lord. And so we oftentimes don't even realize what level of faith to operate in because we don't always understand where our relationship with God is. You know, sometimes we feel like, well, if we miss the mark or we fall or we sin or what have you, that somehow it shifts our relationship or that our relationship is in, you know, is in trouble or is we're in danger of somehow of, of, of losing contact with God because we missed the mark over here or we sinned over here. You know, sin necessarily is not the problem. What the problem is, is that we have unrepented sin and we act as if we do God a favor by repenting. No, 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 no. Repenting is for us. Okay. Let me get, let me tell you that repentance is for us. You know, we're not doing God a favor by repenting. So sin necessarily is not a real big issue because we are uh, uh, in this flesh and we are subject to sin. Yes, we are. However, 
when we allow unrepented sin to remain in our lives, that's when the problem come in. That's when you start to feel kind of separated from God and you feel the, the relationship kind of winding down. You know, you're no longer in the romance phase. You're no longer in the wine and dying phase. You're no longer in the honeymoon phase with God. Now you're just kind of feeling the strain from him, almost heading to the divorce phase. And so what you have to do, you have to get your mind, you have to get your heart and your body. You got to get all of that in one, in one mindset to say, listen, Lord, I repent. I've fallen short of your glory. I've sinned. Whatever you got to do, do it. Okay. So you will understand where your relationship with God is because based on your relationship with him, that's how your faith is going to work for you. Okay. All right. So uh, how does faith work? I've been sharing my journey with you. I make, make no secret about it. Um, not even ashamed of it anymore. I used to be because a lot of times when you start telling people that you're dealing with certain things, uh, one of the things people are, are, are so quick to say is, well, you know, just have faith in God. You know, God's going to bring you through or you know, we believe in God for miracle signs and wonder. Honey, it's a miracle sign and a wonder that I'm still uh, where you have to walk, you know, and it's kind of difficult uh, when you try to explain. I don't know why God does what he does. I don't even know how he does what he does, but I'm thankful that he keeps doing what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes you just all you can do is say, well, by the grace of God, I'm still here. You know, I'm still here by the grace of God. A lot of you that deal with uh, cancer and tumors and lupus and diabetes and uh, blood disorders, uh, uh, so many things more than uh, this COVID-19 is going on. There, there were things going on before that even hit as hard as it hit. It's hitting, you know, and we needed faith before this came along. So surely we'll need faith now. And so how does your faith work? I'm going to read a few scriptures to you and then we're going to I'm going to read something to you out of one of my books. And then um, I'm going to give away a few of these books and then I'm going to be done. OK. So when you come in, click share for me. So here's what's happening. How does faith work? Let's go to Romans 10. Romans 10, 17. Let's read that. We're going to start there. And then from there, we're going to go into uh, my book on fasting and praying. OK, if you don't have it and you want a free copy, put it in the comments and say, hey, I want a copy of that book. I'll send it to you absolutely free. All right. I'll let you know when I run out of free the free ones that's, that I'm going to give away. OK. All right. So are you at Romans 10, 17? Romans 10, 17 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Verse 17 is where I want to park. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're talking about tonight, how do we get faith to work. Good evening, cousin. I love you. God bless you. How do we get faith to work? Uh, people have asked me, uh, how, how do you make going through look so easy? Well, I didn't know that's what I did. I just try to get up every day. And if I wake up and I look around and I'm still here, I just try to determine to keep living. You know, uh, uh, just keep, keep wait. If you keep waking up, then keep living. You know, that's the best I can do. Um, without, you know, uh, just totally taking a preach moment because there are times where 
I'm just walking around and, and the anointing of God would just fall on me. And then I begin to think about the three years that I couldn't see, I couldn't drive myself, I couldn't go anywhere by myself, you know, I couldn't live by myself. All of these things sometimes just hit me at one time. And then before I know it, my hands go up. I start singing worship songs. And before I know it, I'm right smack in the middle of his presence, almost like looking him face to face where he's embracing me and I'm embracing him. And we're just having our moment, you know, because he has been just that good to me. There is no way I could have on my own or because I was so good or because I was so holy or because I was so righteous or because I never made a mistake or because I never did anything on purpose or because I never sinned, I never cussed, I never, you know, committed fornication, I never did any of that. No, 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 no. Whatever God decided to do in, for, and through me, it was all based upon his will. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. Trust me when I tell you that. It had nothing to do with me because I know for a fact that I personally did not qualify for miracles, signs, and wonders if that was uh, uh, the registering or the measuring stick, if there had to be one to where you had to qualify. Honey, listen, I didn't qualify for a miracle, a sign, or a wonder. I didn't even qualify for a good old fashioned, just heal and just touch me and let me, you know, let the pain leave or something. I didn't qualify for any of that. So whatever God did, he did it because of his will and his plan. All right. So then God does what he does, but we have to activate our faith in order to receive what he does. So it's like, it's like, um, you keep saying, well, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. And there's a plate of food sitting right in front of you. I'm hungry, I'm so hungry. And somebody put a plate of food in front of you. All you gotta do is reach over, take the fork and start eating because the food is sitting right there, but it's gonna take you to do something in order to fulfill that hunger that's in you. It's just, That's how faith works. You can keep saying, Lord, I need something. I need this and I need that and I need this, but then you gotta get up and do something. You gotta position yourself. Well, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. So then you gotta position yourself somewhere to be able to hear the word so that you can still hear it. So whatever you hear, that thing is going to activate your faith. It's going to get you motivated to start believing and trusting God. Some of you have been in a relationship with the church for so long. You've been let down so long. Now you don't want to have anything to do with church. You don't want to have anything to do with the Lord. You don't want to hear no scriptures. You don't want to hear any of that. But He's loving. He's just. He's kind. You know, God. God he 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 wants us to come together. He God is not a divider like that. You know. Uh, uh, now he is a daughter. He is a he's a good father now. So he does chastise his children. But God's chastisement is a one of righteousness and holiness to bring us back to Him. When we go to chastise each other, we try to destroy. We want to throw rocks and hide our hands. We want to smear mud on each other. You know, we want to get you to get back. We want to do all of that. But when God does something, He does it for the purpose of bringing us back to Him. You know, shaking us up a little bit, get us to come to our our senses, if you will. So faith then has to be uh, uh, almost the the outcome of your experience with God. That's what I wanted to tell you. Your faith and your level of faith is the outcome of your experience with God. And so if you keep running away from every experience that God tried to, God, God is taking you through, if you throw in the towel, if you get mad and stump off all the time, if you shut out the voices of wisdom all the time, you're going to lessen your experience with God. And so because you have lessened your experiences with God, now you're lessening your level of faith because your faith will come out of what you hear. Well, how do you hear? You keep putting yourself in position to hear. Now that I can hear the word, I'm building my relationship with God. How? Based on what I'm hearing and according to Romans 10, 17, based on what I hear, that's how my faith comes. All right. 
So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. All right. So now we know how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Well, how does faith work? What causes faith to work? What causes faith to be activated in us? All right. So I wrote down a few notes and I want you to stay with me uh, because, again, I'm going to switch over and then I'm going to read something to you out of one of my books. You want a book? Come, put in a comment. I want a free book. Absolutely free. I'll ship it to you. You don't even pay for shipping. Absolutely free. All right. But you have to put it in there while I'm live. If you put it in there once I go off, you know, that's not the rules. All right. All right. Uh, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So now how does faith work? There are some things that will literally activate your faith, even when you don't realize that you can actually go through the things that you've gone through. You know how sometimes you can go through something and it seems like, man, I don't, I don't know if I can make it through this. This is, whew, this is, I, I've never gotten, you know, uh, a diagnosis like this. I've never gotten news like this. I, I don't, I, God, you know, how we do, we start saying, well, God, you promised that you wouldn't put any more on me than I can bear. We started, go, we start going, God, why me? You know, all of this, we started going down the line, you know, see if we sinned anywhere, you know, see if we have any unrepentance. Well, that's what I do. See if we have any unrepentant sin in our life or, you know, anytime something uh unfavorable happen. I have this checklist that I go down, you know, like, Lord, you know, did I mistreat somebody? Did I have I seen, you know, I go through this checklist. And when my checklist is done, and I realize, wait a minute, this might work out for my good somehow. But it will definitely work for his glory. I don't know how. So I remember, I kept having strokes. I kept having strokes and I kept having strokes. And so then it was determined they had previously found just a small brain tumor. Well, two years into treatment, the brain tumor did not respond to treatment. In fact, it doubled in size so much so till, you know, um, it started to uh, give me blurred vision. OK, so then they found a second type of brain tumor which caused fluid to remain on my brain and remain on my body. That one took my uh, peripheral completely, completely. I mean, completely. I couldn't see. I couldn't drive. Uh, I had to be driven around for about mm, three years, two and a half, maybe three years or so. And so it took faith for me to... Uh, ask God, you know, then I was kept having these strokes, kept winding up in the hospital each time I would have to uh, stay for about a week, learn how to walk again, learn how to talk, learn how to uh, put sentences together, um, learn noun, verb, you know, agreement, all that kind of stuff. I had to learn my ABCs, learn my numbers, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, it was just a lot. It was a lot. And you never know uh, how much damage a uh, stroke can do to the brain, particularly if you don't have any physical, you know, evidence that you've been through what you've gone through. OK. And so even now, uh, I still have a little trouble. If you just blurt off your phone number to me, child, I'm not going to remember that. So uh, what I do is tell people, you know, um, uh, here, here's my number. Text me your number and say, this is such and such. This is my number. That way I can just lock you in. I don't have to rely on you telling me your number. I already have it. So it took faith to get me from there to where I am because it wasn't just a matter of, okay, we can, we can just fix this. It wasn't an easy fix. You know, it, it, it wasn't an easy fix. And so it took a while and the whole while I'm steady relying on not so much my faith now, because at times my faith was kind of up and down, up and down. I'll be honest, my faith was up and down. What I relied upon to get me through all of that was my relationship with God. You see what I'm saying? Because 
I knew early that my faith was uh, the outcome of my relationship with God. So when my faith was low, I knew I could fall back on my relationship with God because you're not going to always feel like, you know, hey, let's go conquer the world. No, 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 no. You're not going to always feel like that, you know, because I didn't always feel like that. I don't feel like that sometimes right now. But what I do know that my relationship with God has been tested, has been tried, has been through the fire, has been proven, and it is solidified. That's what I do know. You know, uh, I could wake up tomorrow not feeling well. Then the next day, I just wake up like, you know, I'm the sunshine itself. You know, so my faith sometimes can waver, you know. Your faith sometimes may waver. So when you can't depend on your faith, you can always depend on your relationship. Okay. All right. So how does faith work? I wrote down a few things, just four little points I wanted to make. Number one, faith is activated by a need. When we have a need, our faith is activated, you know, and it doesn't matter uh, how large or how small that need is, or to, to someone else, it may seem insignificant or what have you, but faith is activated by your need. Okay. Uh, I remember, uh, I didn't know what to pray for. I, I'm just being honest. I didn't know what to pray for. I, I didn't know. I just knew I needed God. I needed something from him. I didn't even know what I needed. You know, I, I needed something. And so I would, I didn't have anything specific to pray for because let me just be honest, my mind was just everywhere. When I was going through all of that, my mind was everywhere. I had gone through divorce and, it, you know, my mind was just everywhere. I had to end up closing my church, you know, um, because I would have these massive nodes bleeds, bleeds that would just weaken me you know, to the point where it would take two or three days for my body to recover because the nosebleeds would be so massive. And so I wind up having to close my church and that sent me into a further depression. You know, it was like uh, God was punishing me, you know, and I was just like, I don't even know what to ask you for. I don't even know what to say to you at this point, God. I, I know I need you. You know, I don't know if I want you right now, but I know I need you, but I don't even know what to ask you for. I don't know what I need. I just need all of this and all of this in here to stop, to quiet down for a moment and let me breathe, you know. Um, and so, so sometimes your faith uh, comes into play when there are specific needs, you know, and what you might need might be different from what somebody else might need. And so, um, Sharika says, so for example, if I need a healing, my faith will activate that and God will heal me. I believe that because, and it's based on his will. Let me add that according to his will, according to his will. Let, let me, let me, let me put that in there. As long as you believe and according to his will, let me add that in there because I've prayed for people and believe God for their healing and they died, you know, and I was not angry with God because one thing I found out, go back to that relationship with God now, based upon my relationship with him. Yes, God hear us when we pray. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to pray for the sick. The Bible says lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. However, it is still according to his will. You see what I'm saying, Sharika? Yes, according to his will. You know, I was praying over my baby. You know, God, don't let her die. Don't let her die. And right there before my eyes, she died, you know. And so I could not ask God, why didn't you wake her up? Why didn't you, you know, uh, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, but I accepted that it was the will of God, you know, because whatever God's will is, that's what's going to happen. Yes, yeah, some things happen before time and some things happen, you know, however, but at the end of the day, you got to understand that everything still moves by the power of God. 
you know, and so if it seems to have worked against you and you are a dedicated believer and your relationship with God has been tested and proven and tried by fire, let me tell you something, as bad as that thing might hurt, I promise you some kind of way it'll still work for your good, but it'll work for his glory. Amen. So, okay, you guys, you can't inbox me while I'm on live because I can't answer, uh, but you can uh, comment while I'm on live and I can see your comments, okay? Um, but if you want to talk directly to me, send me an email at resilience. Uh, life coach notary LLC at gmail.com. Uh, and we can talk face to face via Zoom. If you have Zoom, if not, download the Zoom app and send me your the email that you use to sign up for Zoom. Send that email to me at resilience life coach notary LLC at gmail.com. Resilience is spelled R E S I. L I E N C E Life L I F E C O A C H N O T A R Y L L C at gmail.com. That's resilience life coach notary LLC at gmail.com. All one word. Okay. Send me an email there with. With, a, with the email that you use to sign up for Zoom, send that email to my email address and say, hey, sign, put me on your Zoom contact. And then you and I can talk face to face one on one when I'm not on live. OK. All right. Thank you. Love you. Mean it. All right. So faith is activated by need. That's number one. Your faith will be activated by need, whether it's a need for you or it's a need for someone you love. OK, uh, you can have a loved one that needs healing or, or needs a breakthrough, need deliverance, um, need whatever they need. Uh, and perhaps they don't have the faith, you know, or they don't have the relationship, but you do. So you can use your faith to get them to a place to where God responds to your faith, watch this, but on their behalf. You see what I'm saying? He responds to your faith. He responds to your prayer, but then they are the beneficiary of your relationship with God. Why? Because faith is the outcome of your relationship with God. All right. And so that's how come a lot of times people struggle. They're not so much struggling with their faith. A lot of times what it is, there's a struggle in the relationship, because once you get to a certain relationship with God, listen, you'll understand that he is a good, good father. You'll understand that whatever his children need, he has already provided. You'll understand that there's no such thing as God being a deadbeat dad. No, 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 no. You will understand that while you're calling on him, he's already coming to you. You will understand certain things about God that you won't understand just, you know, kind of like on a casual a relationship, it's kind of like the difference between dating somebody and marrying them. Listen, in the dating phase, you don't get all the benefits that you get when you become a husband or you become a wife. That's a whole nother level. That's a level of covenant. That's a level of commitment. That's a level of sticking to it. That's a level of forbearing. That's a level of long suffering. You don't get all of that with just a casual uh, uh, acquaintance. And so if faith then is activated or if faith then is the outcome of our relationship with God, what we need to really, really get insecure is our relationship. We don't worry so much about trying to get it right and, you know, trying to say the right things and say the right words and be so churchy about everything. Work on the relationship part of it and then everything else will fall in place. All right. So faith, one of the things that activates your faith is a need. The next thing, faith is also activated by situations. There are situations that will come in your life. And honey, you'll spend day and night trying to figure out 
Lord, where did this come from? Why me? You know, like, I didn't ask for this situation. Like, you know, like, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get over this? How am I going to get through this? You know, and there are so many questions because now you got these situations or a situation that you're facing, but you don't have any real recourse of action because number one, most of us are not prepared when situations hit us. Let's just be honest. We're not prepared for bad news from the doctor. We're Especially when you haven't been feeling bad or you know you just you, you thought you was taking decent care of yourself and then all of a sudden boom you get this report and now you got this situation going on you know people around you are changing towards you you don't understand what God is doing he's trying to get you to a place well are you trying to make me a loner God what are you doing are you punishing me situations will cause your faith to start doing things your faith would not normally do outside of the situations. And so sometimes all those situations are, don't always seem good. They don't seem favorable. They don't seem pleasant. They don't seem uh, 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 like we can tolerate them. I can tell you this one thing, whatever situation that comes, God will get the glory out of it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how the situation itself turns out. Some Somehow another, I'm telling you, I'm a witness. Somehow another, God has a way to make it work for your good. I, I don't know how he does it. I'm just glad that he does. I don't know if I share it with you, this particular audience, uh, but like in 2006, my daughter, the one that passed away, she and I and my granddaughter, we were going to the movies, six o'clock PM, Sunday evening. I get this call. It's from my neurologist. I'm like, why is he calling me on a Sunday? You know, man, go home, be with your family. That's what I'm trying to do. So he says to me, uh, Ms. Bradley, are you somewhere sitting down? And I was like, no, I'm actually just bought a ticket, just bought my popcorn. We're actually going to watch a movie, uh, my family. And so he says, well, I need you to get somewhere and sit down because I need to talk to you. I said, well, can't this wait till tomorrow? He said, no, I, I came into my office and I saw an urgent note on my desk to contact you. So I'm like, okay, well, what is it? He says, well, are you sitting down? So I was like, okay. So I went and found a bench and sat down because we were actually heading into our movie theater to see the movie. We paid our tickets. We got our popcorn. We got our, uh, you know, all of our nachos and drinks and whatever. We were heading in the movie theater. And he called, he said, sit down. So I go to sit down. He says, well, your test results came back and we want to, I need to tell you that, um, uh, uh, cancer has metastasized to your brain. I'm going to say metastasized. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. I heard that word before. I said, doesn't metastasize mean to spread? He was like, yes. I said, so where did it spread from? No one ever told me that I had any form of cancer before. So if you guys are saying it metastasized to my brain, then that means it had to come from somewhere else in my body. He says, yes, you're absolutely right, but we don't know from where. And I say, well, how can you be so sure then? So surely I thought you guys have made a grave mistake. You know, you got my files mixed up. There's no way in the world you telling me I got brain cancer. He says, well, Miss Bradley, I need you to take this serious. He says, I've gone over the report uh, over and over the report and the results are still reading the same. He says, I looked at the scans over and over. The report is still reading the same. I said, so what, what, what does that mean? What are you trying to tell me? He says, well, I need you to go home and get your affairs in order. I said, get, <laughs> I'm like, do what? Get my affairs in order. Like I said, you're talking to me like I'm going to die. He was like, well, yeah, but we don't know how long you have because we don't know at what stage this might be in. Uh, we're still uh, meeting. We're still uh, comparing notes. And I'm just like, <laughs> you can't be serious. You can't be. He said, Miss Bradley, I really need you to take this serious. You know, I had just come out of a divorce after being married for 20 years, you know, uh, my daughter at 19 years old had been uh, 
diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I'm just like, no, this can't be happening. You know, this, this just can't be happening. You know, the friends I thought I had, you know, amongst the clergy were like, you know, prophet is what you going to do now? Like, I don't know. You know, you want to stop asking me all these, well, what happened? When y'all got divorced, I didn't even know y'all was going through nothing. When you stop asking me all these questions and just pray, tell me I'm going to be all right, do something. But I didn't get that. I didn't get that encouragement. I didn't get that, you know, that support system. And so he says, well, I need you to go home and talk to your family and begin to get your affairs in order. So I asked him again, I say, so are you saying I'm going to die? He says, yes. So I said, when? He was like, I don't know, but I need you to take this seriously. I need you to go home, get your affairs in order. So we didn't even see the movie. They had to wind up giving us a rain check on the movie uh, because I was so distraught. So I, I, we get home. I run in my closet. I'm screaming. I'm crying. I gather all my medical uh, stuff together. I compiled a, a folder of all my medical, of everything. And I um, made copies of everything. And I sent it to my brother. And I called him crying and screaming. He was like, I, I, can't, I can't understand you. You got to calm down. And I was like, this thing, I'm dying. I'm going to die. So I was like, I'm going to send you everything. Anything happened, please look out for my children. And you know, it was just, it was horrendous news. So now I got this situation where these people are telling me I'm dying. They don't tell me how long I'm going to have to live. You know, well, we don't know. We just need you to take this seriously and be in a hurry about getting your affairs in order. Okay. Okay. That was like 2006, you know. And so during that whole situation, I cried a lot. I questioned God a lot. You know, I was like, listen, I, I have dedicated my whole life to you. Why would you let me die like this? You know, uh, and from where is cancer coming? No one ever, much as I go to the doctor and keep up with my checkups and all of that, you know, nobody ever said anything to me. So long story tolerable, they sent me to a specialist, to the oncologist, and he ran the test, and he confirmed the test that it was true. So we got ready to set up for me to start having chemo and all of that stuff. So I go back to the doctor, and he repeated the whole spectrum of tests, um, two days of testing two days when i tell you those people check me from the hairs on my head to the toenail on my feet they check every part of my body trying to find out uh where did it spread from because if you guys are telling me that it had metastasized or spread to my brain then it has to have come from it had to have come from somewhere else in my body like you know, it didn't just fall out the sky in my head. You know, where did it come from in my body? So they were trying to find uh, where did it come from? So they literally, it was a two day long testing process. You know, um, I would be in, check in the hospital in the morning, go home in the evening, come back the next day, check into the hospital in the morning, go home in the evening. And the entire time I'm there, test after test after test after test when i say even my fingernails my toe they tested every part of my body so the day i go in to start the chemo treatment the nurse comes running out to me and i'm already nervous cuz i'm trying they still haven't told me how long i have yet and at what stage i'm at they still haven't told me that they just told me to get everything in order And so I go in, the nurse comes out, she comes running out to me. Oh, Miss Bradley, Miss Bradley. My heart literally like fell in my feet. I was like, okay, they're going to tell me how long I have now. All the tests have come back. Now they're going to tell me how long I have to live. Well, she came back and she was looking a little flustered and all of that. So um, 
she was like, oh, don't cry, don't cry. It's not bad at all. It's not bad news. I'm just crying, 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 crying. She said, it's not bad news. It's not what you think. So I'm thinking, so what you running out here like that to me for, you know? So she gets me and she takes me in the back. And so um, Dr. Sarma, which later on winded up treating my daughter uh, for her cancer uh, and got her to the place of remission, um, in her cancer battle. Uh, so he came in and he said to me, he says, Ms. Bradley, um, we have tested you and every part of your body that was testable. We have tested you for two days. And he said to me, he said, um, we cannot find anywhere in your body where cancer came from. And I said, well, is it still in my brain? He said, here's the thing. So now he's looking confused. And I'm trying not to break down again because I still don't know what's going on. All I know, the situation now has come into my life that I have no control over. So he says to me, I, I, he says, I'm a little baffled by your reports now. He says, because your first set of tests confirmed what the first neurologist found. He said, but then we did another set. He said, and this set has me a little baffled. And I said, so what, what, what's going on? He said, here's the thing. We cannot, we cannot find any cancer anywhere in your body, including where we previously saw it. So I go, so you mean tell me the tests were wrong the first time and the tests were wrong the second time because this was like the third set of tests. He says, no, ma'am, that's not what I said. I said to you, we confirmed the test. When we did the test the second time, we confirmed what the first neurologist said. We saw what he saw. He said, but by the time we got to the third set of tests, this is how long the process was. And the whole time, I'm still not knowing, well, how long I got to live. When I called my brother, I was screaming and hollering so much. He was like, listen, this is not what we do. He said, you got to calm down. You got to stop screaming. He said, go somewhere and pray. He said, this is not what we do. He said, you cannot hear God if you're screaming. So I got off the phone with him. I went in my closet and just screamed and cried and cried and cried and prayed and cried until I literally fell asleep in my closet. The doctor comes and he says to me, I said, so it was a mistake. He said, no, there was no mistake. I said, so what happened? You know, now I'm, I'm kind of frustrated because now I feel like y'all don't know what y'all doing. He says, well, here's what happened. When the first neurologist did the test, it came back that cancer had spread to your brain from somewhere, but he didn't know where. He said, so that's why he sent you to me. Uh, I did the test, he said, and the test came back to confirm what he saw. He said, I saw what he saw. He said, but right before we got ready to start your chemo, he says, Something told me to run another set of tests on you. And that was the two day testing period. So by now, this is like the third set of tests that I had gone through. He said, so when those tests came back, uh, we were confused. He said, so whatever, I said, so was it ever there? He said, oh, it was there because I saw it. He said, I saw it myself. He said, so whatever was there, it's no longer there. I said, so you, are you telling me I'm not gonna die? He says, no ma'am. He says, whatever was there, he said, and I promise you it was there. So he pulls up my skin. He says, you see that crack in your skull that goes across your skull like that? He said, that's what we were seeing. It was like something was eating away at my skull from the inside out and left a big crack in it. And he showed it to me. So I said, what does all this mean for me? He says, well, it means you're gonna live. And what we saw is no longer there. And honey, let me tell you something. 
I rejoiced and I rejoiced and I rejoiced. This was in 2006, okay? We're in 2020, all right? And so the Lord, uh, sometimes your faith can be pushed. You can be pushed to activate your faith when situations that are out of your control happen. Because normally when something happens, we can kind of get control of the situation, you know, but what happens when a situation just slips through our hand and we can't get control of it? That's when our faith has to be activated. All right. All right. So the next thing, how does faith work? What activates your faith? Number three, Number one was a need. Number two, situations. Number three, opportunities. Opportunities have a way of, 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 of activating our faith um, because sometimes we can miss opportunities because we don't think we can have it or we don't think we deserve it. We don't think we deserve that position. We don't think we deserve to be with that person or we don't think we deserve to be blessed like that. We don't think we deserve to live, you know, free from money troubles. We don't think we deserve to be able to go buy what we want when we want it and don't have to keep checking, you know, let me see what my balance is first. You know, a lot of times we don't think we deserve those particular opportunities in life because whatever reason sometimes it, it's been inbred in us that you know uh don't forget where you came from you know uh don't try to get too big you know or 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 you know stay humble it's like when when people start seeing you become successful they always want to throw that line at you stay humble you know and sometimes i get so just uh with people they're like what does trying to be successful and trying to have a better life for you and your family what does that have to do with being humble one thing does doesn't have anything to do with the other you know because and then i hate it when people say oh don't forget where you come from no 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 the problem is you can't forget where i came from that's the problem the problem is you can't forget that you also had the same opportunity that i had but what happened i activated my faith but here we go again, based on my relationship, and you did not because you were so busy watching me and trying to tell me, stay in my place, trying to tell me, don't get ahead of myself. Because most of the time when your opportunity comes and you share it with people, what they'll say, oh, I'm happy for you, I'm praying for you. You got to make sure those people are praying for you and not against you. Because a lot of times people have this hidden jealousy. And every time you get a good opportunity, you will share it with the wrong person before you let that opportunity activate your faith and one word from them can deter you from going after that opportunity one negative word from them can deter you from believing that this is something you actually deserve one word from them can actually deter you and now you can take on their negativity and start speaking doom and gloom to your own opportunities you'll be closing doors on yourself and God is like listen I've opened this door for you walk through it run through it leap through it Hop through it, skip through it, heck, crawl through it if you have to, but just get through it. And so oftentimes our faith will be activated uh, by our opportunities. And again, be careful when opportunities come and when opportunities are knocking, be careful who you have there when you open that door. All right. All right. The last thing, crisis. Crisis will activate your faith like nothing else that I've ever seen. When you are facing a crisis, right now we're facing a global crisis. Some of you are facing your individual crisis and your faith now needs to be activated on a level that you have not activated your faith on. You know what I'm saying? And again, your faith will be the outcome. Your level of faith will be the outcome of your relationship with God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So based on your relationship, it will determine your ability to hear. And within your ability to hear, then your, the outcome of your ability to hear and relate to God, uh, where we get relationship, that will form your faith, okay? Because faith comes by hearing, all right? So it, like I said to you earlier, even if you got to pick up the word and just read it out loud so you can hear it, build your hearing up. So in that, you're building your relationship. And when you build your relationship, you can build your levels of faith. There are levels 
to faith, okay? Everybody and everything, everybody go through does not have the same level of faith. Why? Because it doesn't take the same level of faith to heal cancer that it might take to heal a broke toe. Did y'all hear what I just said? Everybody will have a different level of faith. It does not take faith to get through uh, 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 a common cold like it might take to get through this pandemic. You know what I'm saying? So every time you go through something, every time there is a major crisis, it's going to automatically shift your faith to a different level. My prayer is that it does not cause you to lose your faith because in losing your faith, here's what losing your faith really does. Losing your faith, it kind of makes the relationship a little rocky because now you, you know he's God, but you don't know if he's going to answer you. You know he's God, but you don't know if he's going to heal you. You know he's God, but you don't know if he's going to deliver you. You know he's God, but you don't know how long this is going to last. You know he's God, but you don't know how you're going to come out. You know he's God, but you don't know if you can make it while you're in it. You see what I'm saying? And so what happens during a crisis, it starts to mess with our relationship. And when our relationship becomes unstable, then our faith becomes unstable stable. So when we experience these crises in our life, like we are experiencing right now, we have to make sure that our relationship has been solidified by fire and by, by going through and by standing strong and by forbearing and, and long suffering and all of that. It doesn't necessarily mean you got to go without. I have no idea where that come from. Being, you know, going without and being humble. Listen, it's not the same thing. You know, and, and I don't know. I think it's just an old slave mentality that says that the, the broker you are or the less you have, the closer you are to God. Try y'all keep that. Keep that. All right. My faith suggests something completely different to me. You know, and so when crises come in, you have got to hold on. If Even if you can't hold on to your faith, hold on to your relationship with them, because the more you hold on to your relationship, the more your faith will be the outcome of that relationship. Because there are times during crises, we don't know. Uh, uh, listen, if we'll be honest, a lot of us were afraid when this pandemic hit. A lot of us were fearful. Yes, we were. A lot of us were worried. Am I going to get it? Am I? Will my family members get it? Will someone at my church get it? Will someone I love or hold dear to me get it? We, we were concerned. We were worried. We were fearful. And then God had to speak to us. God had to speak to us individually and he had to speak to us corporately as the body of Christ. You see what I'm saying? And so when he began to speak to us, you know, those of us that were in position to hear, all he said was, listen, I didn't give you the spirit of fear, but of love, power and of a sound mind. Hold on. Hold on. This too shall pass. Well, then how come so many people are dying from it? That's something we don't have the answer to. The only thing we can answer right now and the best thing for us to do right now is focus on making sure our individual uh, relationships with God uh, are solidified, you know, uh, to, through the power of the Holy Ghost, through the power of the word of God, through the power of calling on the name of Jesus, through the power of being kind to one another, through the power of, you know, being long suffering and forbearing with one another, you know, uh, uh, showing one another love. Listen, even those that uh, uh, despitefully use you, be kind to them, but do it from afar. You understand what I'm saying? And so we have got to get to the place. Well, listen, I know we're in a crisis. I know it. I know it. But let this crisis uh, uh, push you into a relationship with God that's so solid until that even when you sometimes falter or, or, or your faith kind of gets a little wavy at times, you can still lean on the relationship that you have with him. Because I don't know what might come of this situation, but I know what's going to happen in this relationship. I know if I lean on him, he's not going to let me fall. You understand what I'm saying? I know if I call on him, he's not not going to ignore me. I know if I cry, he'll catch my tears and bottle them up. I know that if I call his name, he recognizes my voice because he's 
familiar with me. You understand what I'm saying? He's made himself familiar with me. Well, how do I know that? Because I made sure that he's familiar with me because I make sure that I spend that quality time with him. You understand what I'm saying? And so these are the things that will get your faith to moving. Even when you don't understand what's going on, you, you, you don't have any answers. One thing you can rest assured upon is that your relationship will always, uh, uh, your faith will be the outcome of your relationship. I'm going to read one more thing to you. Um, and then uh, I'm going to be done. So we talked tonight about how does faith work? We understand what faith is. How do we get faith activated? Faith is activated by hearing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We read Romans 10 and 17. Well, we actually started at 14. So uh, you can read Romans 10, 14 through 17. That's the scripture we started out with. And so we're going to end. Then, I, then we went to how does faith work? I gave you four points on how faith works. Number one, faith works by need. Whenever there is a need, faith is activated. Number two, situations activate our faith. Number three, opportunities activate our faith. And number four, crises activate our faith. All right. And so our closing scripture is coming from my book. Um, this is day one of my book, 21 Days of Fasting and Praying. If you want a book, you have to comment, I would like a book during the broadcast and I will send you a free book. OK, if you wait till I'm off the air, then, you know, you can get it from Amazon.com. OK, but if you say, hey, I want a free book, I'll, sh I'll ship it to you absolutely free of charge. OK, so day one, we talked about releasing the spirit of fear. And I wanted to put this in your hearing tonight because I know a lot of people are still fearful with this pandemic going on. And I want you not to be fearful, uh, but I want you to be wise, okay? And I want you to be careful. I want you to exercise wisdom and caution and all of that, but let's not be fearful. So day one in my book talks about uh, releasing the spirit of fear, Psalms 27 and one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I'm just going to read a little bit this a little bit of this a little bit of this to you. Fear is a feeling of agitation and anxiety caused by the presence or imminence of danger. It's apprehension. A fear is caused by a lack of confidence. So remember I told you your faith is the outcome of your relationship with God. It's not the other way around. You don't build your relationship with God based on your faith, because what happens when that faith is like, you know, kind of like a wavy ocean, uh, that'll determine if your faith determine your relationship. Most of us wouldn't have a relationship. Let's just be honest. So then it has to work in the opposite that your re that faith is the outcome of your relationship. Your relationship is not the outcome of your faith, okay? Faith is the outcome of your relationship because faith wavers. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so we must have the same confidence in God that David exemplified here in Psalms 27 and 1. David's confidence was tenfold. Number one, he said, the Lord is my light. The light there is that form of energy that makes it possible to see things. We need the light of the Lord in order to see. Number two, he said, he's my salvation. That's a deliverance from the power and effects of sin or evil. Number three, he said, the Lord is my trust. That's an assured reliance on the character, the ability, the strength, or the truth that someone is reliable. Someone is good. Someone is honest. Watch this one. And someone is effective. All right. Number four, he is my strength, the ability to resist being moved or broken by a force. I love God. I love him. Number five, he is my life. That means he's my spiritual existing existence. Watch this. Transcending spiritual death. You can't kill God. You understand? You, you can't kill him. He's my confidence. He is my faith or belief that one will act in a right, proper, 
or effective way, watch this, which establishes intimate trust. There we go again. We're talking about that relationship. So then faith, again, is the outcome of my relationship with God. All right. Number seven, he's my protector from the wicked. That means he guards against morally bad, unpleasant or evil, mischievous people. He guards me from those people. He is uh, my protector from my enemies. That means he guards against someone, watch this, who hates me, who tries to harm me, who threatens me or to overthrow or injure me or you in any way. God is our protector from our enemies. Number nine, he's my protector from the multitude. That means he guards us against a great number of people that might press against you. You understand? Number 10, he is my help in war. That means he aids or makes it easier during a period of fighting or hostile conflict. All right. That's Psalms 27 and 1. I broke that down for you because we saw that in, two, seven, in Psalms 27 and 1, we saw David exemplify. We saw David extolling God as a tenfold God. You know, we saw him worshiping and, and showing us that my confidence in God is actually tenfold. All right. So when you have this much confidence in God, no one or nothing can stand before you or stop you. Fear loses its grip over your life forever, and you're free to accomplish anything your heart desires. When the Lord is your strength, he empowers you to do all things without being afraid. Allowing God to be your light, your salvation, your strength, and your confidence will annul the power of fear over your life. Further, no matter how many negative people sin sins into your path to tell you what you can't do, uh, what you can't be, what you can't have, know that their negative words, their negative thoughts, or their negative deeds towards you are absolutely powerless. God will send you help. Do not be afraid. You are not alone. You have angels assigned to fight for you. Here's how the Message Bible reads uh, Psalms 27 and 1. It depicts God as light, space, zest. Light, space, zest. That's God. So with him on my side, I'm fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. You become empowered to do great things without fear of people or circumstances. Again, I've read to you day one, uh, releasing the spirit of fear from my book, 21 Days of Fasting and Praying. If you like a free copy, as long as I'm on the air, go ahead and say, I want a copy. I'll send it to you absolutely free after I'm off the broadcast you know, then you can get it from Amazon. All right. All right. So thank you uh, for tuning in uh, tonight. I do pray that I said something to encourage your heart. I do hope that I help you understand how faith works, what it takes to activate your faith. And I also have, I, I hope I help you understand that there are different levels of faith, you know, and faith works according to needs, situations, opportunities, crisis, all of those things can get your faith to working. However, your faith will be the outcome of your relationship with God, all right? So you want to really build on your faith. You don't have to say, well, Lord, you know, I need you to give me more faith. No, 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 no. Ask him to give you more of a relationship with him. Because let me tell you something, when you build upon that relationship, situations will come, needs will come, opportunities will come, and crises will come. And it'll cause you to have to lean on that relationship that you have built, you know, that relationship, that foundation of the relationship that you have built. And so it'll cause you to have to lean upon that. It'll cause you to have to put your ear uh, 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 I like to say, put your ear to God's chest so you can hear his heartbeat because his heartbeat has a rhythm. And if you want to stay in sync and if you want to stay in harmony with God, you got to stay close enough to him so you can put your, your head and your ear to his chest to hear his heartbeat so you can keep up with his rhythm. That way you stay inside of his will. You, you continue to build and solidify your relationship why? Because you're going to always be in sync with him. Will you miss it? Of course you will. But if you keep your ear close enough to his chest, lay your head close enough to him so you can hear his heartbeat, he'll keep you in sync and in step with his heartbeat. Why? Because God's heartbeat has a rhythm to it. All right.
All right. Know that I love you and I pray that I said something to help you tonight in your walk of faith and in your relationship with God. So we're going to pray uh, particularly for those that are afraid during this time of crisis and for those that are going through your individual crisis, uh, whether it be whatever sickness or financial needs, you know, we know a lot of people are afraid financially right now. You know, a lot of people didn't plan for a rainy day, you know, because we all, we thought we was just going, it was going to be sunny all the time. Some people did plan and put away, you know, six months to a year of living money. You know, some, some of us did that and some didn't. So some people are okay and some people are not okay. You know, uh, I want to make sure that wherever you are, you know, your relationship with God is solid. And because your relationship with God is solid, then your faith still has the opportunity uh, uh, to help you make it through this time, through this crisis, through this time of need, through this situational time, through this time where opportunities may or may not be there. You see what I'm saying? So let us pray. Father, we thank you. And we declare that your name is holy. We thank you for uh, uh, how you're just watching over us. And God, even in the midst of this uh, uh, coronavirus and people are getting sick and people are dying, we thank you that people are actually are also getting healed from it, God. We thank you for the testimonies that we're hearing uh, uh, as well, God. And we just ask now, Father, we know that you did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. God, I just ask that you release fear from all of the people all over this world. God, give them hope, give them joy, give them peace of mind. God, wherever there needs to be finances provided, God, you be uh, Jehovah Jireh, you be their provider. Wherever there's healing, God, you be Jehovah Rapha, you be their healing. Whatever they need, God, you be that to them in this time of crisis throughout the world, Father. Father, we repent as a world, we repent as a nation, we repent as a people, we repent as the church, oh God, and we ask that you forgive us, cleanse us, and wash us again, oh God. Breathe on us afresh, oh God. And God, we are careful now. We understand why you spoke what you spoke. We now even understand when you are silent, oh God. And we thank you because your loving kindness has been better to us than life itself. God, we give you glory and we give you honor. We're praying for the members and the families of the Church of God in Christ, oh God. And for everyone that's been empowered impacted or affected by the virus or, or even the sicknesses, uh, uh, cancer, lupus, uh, tumors, what have you got. We know you're able, whatever the situations, whatever the illness is, we know that you're able. God, we're living testimony of your miracle signs and wonders. We're a living testimony that you are still sovereign, oh God. We're a living testimony, oh God, that you are holy and you're righteous, oh God. And God, we just ask you, we ask you, God, to have mercy upon us, oh God. Have mercy upon this land. Have mercy upon the church. Have mercy upon us corporately. Have mercy upon us individually, God. And God, we'll be careful as in all things to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. This we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you again for tuning in. Live talk with Benita Bradley. Again, I'm your host and I thank you uh, for allowing me to share this time with you. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to try to come on a little bit earlier. So stay tuned. Make sure you keep your notifications set. All week long, I'll be giving away books. All week long, I'm going to give away something. So stay connected, all right? And I will see you tomorrow, all right? Good night. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Practice social distancing. But most of all, stay home, all right? Bye-bye.